Okay. Uh, let's see if my slides will show up. Yes, they will. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm Vaishali Kamen, as Joe said. I work for a leading product development and technology innovation company, Cambridge Consultants. Uh, for those of you that haven't heard about Cambridge Consultants, we are a global footprint based out of Cambridge, UK, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, which was Cambridge still, uh, as well as Singapore. We serve a global client base uh, doing a lot of different things, starting from user needs and understanding what product is necessary, strategy for roadmap, all the way through the difficult engineering and into manufacturing uh, or deployment. Clients range from a number of different sectors, as you see on the slides there. For those of you that flew here, uh, you've probably used our product. Uh, we work for Park Air, uh, which is now part of Northrop Grumman, to develop air traffic control radar. That's on one side of the spectrum. The other side is healthcare, which is where I come from. And in the middle, lots of different consumer technologies, which I can't talk about, but you see the client list there. So working with an interesting group of people doing lots of different technologies, uh, we've got to see a little bit of the global market as well. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to take you on a journey outside this dark room in Vegas. Yes, thank you, whoever did the shush. Um, outside of this dark room in Vegas and uh, see what's happening in the rest of the world, the emerging countries or the developing economies. Now, if you're wondering why you should care, Let's think about the expectations. Let's think about some numbers here. 85% of the world's population, yes, we're nearing 7 billion now, 85% of that is outside of the US and Europe. It falls under the developing regions. That's a huge market base, for those of you that are numbers minded. 268 million households above a 10K income. That's more than the US and Eurozone combined. And a final statistic, in case I haven't caught your attention just yet, any pharma people in, in the house? Raise your hands, pharma. Very good, pay attention here. 30% of your market share for 2016, I'm not talking about the future, 2016 is coming from emerging economies. So very good reason for us to be paying attention to what's happening in these developing regions and trying to develop solutions for healthcare in these regions. I want to take you to two aspects. Challenges, what are the issues faced by these, the, these areas? And then opportunities, because we're all about opportunity here. We are the healthcare industry. The first thing I want to talk about is acute incidents, infectious diseases. We've heard a lot about this in 2015, but the incidence of inf infectious diseases is a massive healthcare problem in a lot of the regions in Africa, in India, in, in other developing economies. The challenges that these face include things like supply and distribution of drugs, having the right amount of drug in the right place, but also things like lack of trained personnel, lack of infrastructure, the lack of education and awareness, simple things like personal hygiene, sanitation, education. All of these things contribute to a massive problem around infectious diseases and cost a huge amount for these, these countries. The next thing is actually common with the, the developed world, which is chronic disease. We heard from Philips this morning about some staggering numbers, chronic disease incidents, but we're not alone in the US and Europe. Countries like India and China and, and Brazil are also facing a huge burden of, of chronic disease. Some of this is lifestyle related, but others is just an incidence around growing populations. The challenges here are a little bit different. You need a little bit of focus on preventive care, keeping people well, as someone just said in the previous session, but also around long-term disease management solutions, motivation for people to take care of themselves, and more importantly, the understanding, the awareness that these conditions exist, how they're diagnosed. There's a lot of undiagnosed populations, so these numbers don't even reflect people that are not diagnosed yet. The burden on the governments of these countries is going to be tremendous in the next few years, and gives us a huge opportunity for solutions to tackle these conditions. Now something unique, lack of access. A, a significant portion of the people in emerging countries live in rural areas where there is a lack of infrastructure, distances are huge, there's just no clinical facilities. People in Africa, for example, very often need to walk days and hours to get to uh, the nearest, even the smallest clinical facility. 
this poses an interesting challenge, but also an opportunity. What are we thinking here? Remote care delivery. Hold that thought in your mind. We'll come back to it again in a little bit. The most important difference, which we need to recognize, is the patient or the consumer as the stakeholder. Most of these countries, as of now at least, are self-pay. This is out-of-pocket payment for healthcare. Very different attitude, very different um, motivations and, and reasons for how people will buy healthcare. The other interesting thing is the diversity. So 70% of this market is going to be affordability driven. So low cost, low, cost, low income type of um, sort of structure where you're really worried about what you're paying for healthcare. 20% is value driven. So these are people who, who are sort of middle class, they have the incomes, but they will be thinking carefully about what they spend on. They will think on what they think really meets their needs, really helps them. They're not into gimmicks or gadgets. And then you also have the 10% of the, the top earners within these countries who will want the best in class. They will go for the latest, latest technology, will seek out the best healthcare possible within the country. Now you might think that 30% is not, not sufficient or not enough to, to go out there and do something for, or that the 70% is just you know, too low cost that we can't have solutions for. Wrong on both counts. As an example, 30% of the Indian market, the economy is, the, the size of the market is the size of the United States, the population of the United States. And that's just in India. You have lots of other different markets where the similar 30% is going to be looking for solutions, even if you decide not to go down the low cost route. So enough about this challenges. Let's look at some opportunities. I wanted to talk about a few different things that are my personal thoughts on on just what can be done. Why should you guys be paying attention and thinking about doing something different? Now, I'm not going to go into details of all of these. I'm just putting out some seed ideas that hopefully will kindle some thoughts in your heads and innovation can follow. The first example, needs-driven innovation. The unmet needs are huge. And it's up to us, up to the people on the ground, to figure out what these critical unmet needs are, where there are issues, and how technology can solve these problems. It doesn't need to be complicated and doesn't need to be expensive. Take the example on the screen, LifeStraw. This is a company that just figured out that during natural disasters, or even otherwise in many countries, access to clean drinking water is very, very hard to come by. They developed a filtration system based on a little pipe, similar to a straw, that you can just stick in any pool of water and draw water from it it becomes potable, you can drink that water. Very, very simple solution, very low cost, but it's extremely effective in getting people access to clean water. And guess what, an interesting thing? Reverse marketing. This gadget is now available in the developed countries for camping, backcountry camping, access to water. There you go, solution market, and I looked at uh, this in, on Amazon or something like that. It sells for an enormous amount, 19.99 or something like that. Probably um, not costing all that much, but a good market opportunity nevertheless. Next topic, sorry for the graphic image, um, lower cost innovation. We are in, a, in, a, in the most developed country in the world, access to very, very good technology, very good clinical care, but it's not the case in all of the different areas. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that they can't have the, the technology to solve their problems. As an example, laparoscopy. Laparoscopic towers in this country or, or anywhere in the Western world, about 100K worth of equipment, kit, a tower, if you've been in an OR and seen the tower sitting on the side, about 100K worth of equipment, very high-end cameras, lots of sophisticated tools attached to these. However, it doesn't need to be like that. And in fact, if it is like that, it can't actually serve the markets that, are, that just cannot afford that kind of kit. So Cambridge Consultants sent a team back to India to look at what is the driving factors, what are the constraints in hospitals, and how these people work. Different markets, different cities, rural, urban, they have different needs, different facilities. We also found that surgeons often carry their own kit because they move from hospital to hospital, and each hospital has a different set of infrastructure. They actually need some uniformity, some consistency, so they buy their own kit. Hospitals often don't. They don't have the, the affordability, the, the power to buy this kit. 
So we needed something lower cost, portable, and we came up with a concept that you see on the, on the screen there, applied human factors and industrial design skills, but also technology innovation, found a camera set that replaces the big, high sophisticated, high expensive cameras in, in traditional laparoscopy equipment, designed tools that were sort of one size fits all, you can have a mix and match on those, designed a portable kit, a portable sort of carry case, which the whole equipment can fit into and the surgeon can take it with them. And all of this is at a price point which can be afforded by a surgeon individually, it doesn't have to depend on the hospital to get it. So a good example of how you can have lower cost uh, for good technology innovation combined with the design skills if you understand the constraints that are driving these markets. This is my favorite, digital care delivery. That's why all of us are here. Digital health is key. Uh, remember what I said about uh, remote care delivery for rural access? Now, all of these people in so many rural areas, they do not have landlines. There is no infrastructure for networking, but they all have mobile phones. Vegetable vendors, as well as people sort of living in the farthest, farthest regions, cell coverage is excellent in these countries. In Africa, I was just recently in Africa, literally every corner of the country, you can get cell coverage. What does that mean? That means you can reach these people. You can deliver the tools, the solutions that they need to have via the mobile network. I have a picture of WhatsApp up there because of an interesting story. So physicians in India from rural areas or, or not so big hospitals have teamed up with specialists from, from cities, formed WhatsApp groups, and they're using the WhatsApp group to share knowledge, to, to get opinions, to get referrals or, or references from the, the specialists in the cities on images, on conditions, on, on diagnosis of patients. Now, of, of course, this is a different market, so you don't have that much uh, worry about privacy and security there so much, but it tells you how now they have the tool, it's free, and they're putting it to good use. Similar solutions around telehealth, we keep talking about telehealth, but even for education and training. Lots of ways in which the mobile network or the cell network can be put to use in order for healthcare delivery. Last couple of quick things, education and training. Now this is self-explanatory, the fact that it is necessary and that can be delivered in, in many ways, including using the mobile networks. But I wanted to point out two things that are quite important here. There's two types of education and training required in these countries. One is on the, the mass population, people by themselves. They need to understand sort of the, the awareness around the disease, around preventive care, around how to recognize symptoms, but also for the care delivery people, the nurses, the community health workers, even physicians getting access or knowledge about latest technologies, about what is happening and how they can use that in their own care, in, in their own profession. Finally, partnerships. You don't have to do this alone. You have people, local organizations, local hospital groups, local NGOs, non-government or non-profit organizations who are available and willing to help and can be an excellent, excellent resource. An example, recently announced partnership by Sanofi, big pharma company in diabetes, with uh, Apollo Hospitals, which is a fairly big hospital group in Asia, to provide diabetic clinics. So they've started local diabetic clinics in, in all different parts of the country and providing education, providing disease management, providing solutions for people at a much lower cost. Finally, in conclusion, the global health epidemic is, is happening, unfortunately. There are lots and lots of reasons why we should be doing something as a community, as global citizens, but as the healthcare industry, to address these markets. And it's not just because it makes business sense, not just because there's a lot of money to be made, but in my opinion, there's perhaps one or two things we could learn from these markets, one or two things that can teach, can, we can teach ourselves around innovation, around lower cost, and how some of these fresh perspectives can be brought back home here to the Western markets, because we could definitely also use lower cost solutions to help our own healthcare systems in, in the US and in Europe. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you, Jill, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Vitaly. So uh, they have an amazing exhibit downstairs. So I highly suggest if you have some time to go down there. Um, I'm, it, it is, uh, it's, it's fantastic this year. I was really excited. So um, I'm just going to make sure we're good to go here. I'm going to.
Uh, move quickly on to... <laughs>